answer your prayer. We will call on him to learn. What more can he do? He will tell you how he loves you and will provide and forgive. And call on him. Morning. Again. We're back. What are we doing? What are we studying? Who remembers? It's been a couple of weeks. What are we studying? Huh? We are rediscovering the church. What does that mean? To rediscover the church. We're trying to get our minds and our hearts wrapped around what is church supposed to be? What, what was the church like? Way back in the beginning, <clears throat> how much has changed? We have been on this journey, you know. I went back through all the messages that we've done. We've been at this since early February. Can you believe that? Rediscovering church since early February. Have you rediscovered it yet? Well, we still got a ways to go. And what a journey that we have been on. And I am so excited about this journey that we've been on. I, I, each week I can't wait to see what's next. And uh, when, we, when we get into it, man, God just shows us so much. There's just so much. You know, when we read through, how many of you have actually read through the entire book of Acts? A few of you. Oh, okay. Good. A good number. And we read through it. And we get the story of the church. But there's so much that I've read through it. I've read through the book of Acts. I, 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 we know what happens in the end. However, there's so much more. It's like we got, we tasted the butter on top of the, the toast that we like in the morning. It's just kind of like we 
we've just gotten a little taste of what is going on. And so what we've been doing all these months is we've been digging in and we're trying to get we're trying to get the, the rest of the toast. We want we want the we want the meat from the burger. We want the the the, the steak, whatever it is that makes you want to dig into this. There's so so much more. And so we're going to look at, we're still in chapter 9. Who remembers what we talked about two weeks ago? Three weeks ago. It's been three weeks now. Who did we, who did we start to introduce? Saul. Saul, yeah. Who remembers our first little snippet of an introduction to Saul? Where was that? Stoning of Stephen in Acts 1. No. That's the, that's eight. I can't remember the verse, but he's he's standing there, right? He's standing there in the Yeah. Yeah. So he's hanging out and they're throwing their, their coats at him and they're saying, here, Saul, hold these, and they're stoning Stephen and they're they, they kill him and he's all good with it. He thinks they're doing the the, the work of the Lord. And then, what's our second introduction to Saul? No, no, that's the third one. Second one. Yeah, he's ravaging the church. And that's such a powerful, ugly, nasty word, ravaged the church. I mean, that means he wasn't just insulting the church. He was doing everything he could to destroy it. He wanted to suffer. <coughs> Whatever this new uprising was, right? Then our third introduction to Saul is Road to Damascus. Yeah. Saul, he gets his marching orders. He gets permission from the Sanhedrin. He's got, he's got the paperwork. He's got the posse going with him. He's got... He's got his warrant out to take out any and every Christian he can, and he's headed right to Damascus. And who does he meet? Jesus. And that changed everything. So here we are, chapter 9, verses 25 to 26. Let's just take a little look. Alright? 25 to 26. Actually, I'm going to start at 23. Let's start at 23. And when many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him. But his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. Let's pause there for a second. Does this sound like a familiar story? Where else does this happen? Rahab? And who does Rahab let down through a wall? The spies. The spies. Do we know who the spies are? They were Jewish spies? What? Yeah, these two Jewish spies, they escaped through a wall, let down by Rahab, and this marked their open door to the promised land. Because those two spies got out, and what did they do? They went back and told them what they were up to. Right? They were protected by the Red Ribbon. But in this instance, we're, we're just we're going to focus on those spies because that's a reflection, right, of the beginning of God giving the promised land to the Hebrews, right? He gave it to them, literally. He just said, walk around in circles for seven days, you know, and blow your trumpets. And you know the story of the walls of Jericho come tumbling down. Well, then, here's Saul. Remember, it's not called Paul yet. He will be. But Saul is lowered out of the hole in the wall the same way. Why? Because the Jews were wanting to kill him. Why? Right? What was he doing? 
preaching the, the he's preaching Jesus, the exact group of people he was going out to to haul into jail, he joined them. Right? So these guys are human, man. They want to kill him. So, but here's the question. Here's a question that just keeps popping up in my head, right? Okay, so verse 25, um, he gets dropped down. Oh, let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket, right? This is the master, right? The very next verse, verse 26, and when he came to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him. Is there something missing here? Come back to the phone. Is there something missing? That's the phone, Joyce. Good question. How does he get to Jerusalem? What happens between Damascus and Jerusalem? So, if I were to tell you the story of three bears, right? I'm going to say... There are these three bears living in a house, and they, they come home from whatever it was that they were doing, and they look at their porridge, and the porridge has been messed with. The little guy's porridge is gone. He says, hey, my porridge is gone. And then I say, oh, and then the bears go to the bedroom. They're all tired because they've been, they had a long day, whatever it was they were doing. Maybe they went over to the zoo or something. I don't know. But they get to the bedroom, and Papa Bear's bed's messed up, Mama Bear's bed's messed up, and Baby Bear finds Goldilocks in, the, in his bed, and then I say, then, isn't that a great story? Isn't that some, something missing? What's missing? How about who is Goldilocks? Right? Who is Goldilocks? We skipped the whole section on their chair and the baby bear's chair being broken. I skipped um, introducing who Goldilocks was and what she was doing. We didn't even go through all that Goldilocks actually did for the three bears to get to the point. You see what I'm saying? There's something missing, right? There's a gap in the storyline, right? What about Jesus' timeline? Does the Bible ever do this? Does the Bible ever leave gaps in the story? Okay, so you've got Jesus. We're telling the story of Jesus. Jesus is born in Bethlehem. Then he's a boy, right? He's a boy before the wise men ever even get to him. So our beautiful little manger scenes that we put up every year really are theologically incorrect because they didn't all show up at the same time. Did they? But we need to because... It just makes it easier, and that's what we're used to, right? But, in truth, if you read the scripture, the wise men don't show up for a couple of years, right? So there's a little bit of a gap, but does that deter the truth? Now, before I, before I get into picking this all apart, does this take away any of the truth of God's word? <coughs> Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So just keep that in mind as we do this. So, okay, so he's a boy. Then, all of a sudden, they're going to Jerusalem, and he's 12 years old, right? And he gets, and he's hanging out with the uh, teachers of the law, doesn't tell mom and dad where he went. Mom and dad thinks he's with cousin John. Because we know the Baptist, right? They, they think he's with him, and then all of a sudden, whoa, where's Jesus? <gasps> we just lost the Son of God! Can you imagine, have you ever, I remember as a kid, getting lost in a really small grocery store, and I thought, oh my God, you're in love, right? And the panic that must set in for a parent if you just, because kids are so quick, they can get away so easily, and the panic that must set in, can you imagine the panic of Mary and Joseph thinking, we just lost the Son of God? We're really in big trouble, so I can't win it back to Jerusalem. Then, of course, we know the outcome of that story. I was with my, didn't you know I was with my father? That whole story. And then, all of a sudden, Jesus is 30. And he's getting baptized by John the Baptist. 
And some of the Gospels don't even tell that much of the story. They just start with the baptism of Jesus, right? So what happens to the 18 years between, eight, between ages 12 and 30? Unfortunately for us, the text doesn't say, does it? And we don't ever really get to fill that gap in, do we? We're left with a big gap in the story. However, that doesn't take away from the power and the importance of who Jesus is, right? I was talking with Rachel about this last night before um, she zonked out because it was really, really late. And I'm, of course, I'm still working on this last night at 11 o'clock at night. And I'm just getting, so I'm getting all excited. And then she's like, awesome. I'm like, yeah, but look at this. That's great, man. Thank you. Can I go to sleep now? <laughs> yeah, go ahead, go ahead. So, but here's this big gap that we don't know what to do with. But is that really the important part? No. In fact, maybe God, in fact, Rachel, this is what Rachel said. He said, maybe God didn't intend for us to know all that happened. For all we know, now we can only I can only speculate what happens between age 12 and 30, right? My guess. This is my guess. This is not scripture, so don't, don't write this down. My guess is that Jesus was preparing. He was preparing for what God had for him in the past. That's my thing. He was getting ready. I mean, think about this. He had a three, he was preparing for a three-year meeting. Like, I've got a three-year window to do this. You know, I mean, again, this is all after Mark's speculation guessing by now. But that's what I like to kind of imagine that to be. To fill in that blank. He had to have been getting ready for this. Because by the time he got to John the Baptist, John was going, no, I should be, I, you should be baptizing me. He's like, no. This has to happen. Indicating that he knew exactly the process that he had to, because his ministry had to be a ministry led by example, right? Did Jesus have any sin in his heart to be washed away? Did he have to confess any sin? No. He's God. Right? But he knew that I need to lead by example. Well, the only way you're going to, well, okay, not the only way. He's got to be, he knows everything, right? But his human side says, I need to lead these people by example, and I'm going to get baptized. I'm going to be immersed. And I'm going to come up out of the water, and of course we know what happened to that, right? So, back to Saul. Okay? Thankfully, this little gap, or this humongous gap, between verse 25 and 26 in Saul's story gets filled in. What happens to Saul from Damascus to Jerusalem. We have to look beyond Acts chapter 9. And thankfully, good old Paul, I'm going to call him Paul because I'm referring to his letter, kind of helps fill in the gap. So let's take a look at Galatians chapter 1, verses 14 through 17. Okay? And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal the Son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. He point right there, that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. That's a big gap, folks. Wow! So, if we're only looking at Acts 9, verses 25 and 26, there's a lot that happens between the 
Damascus and Jerusalem, right? He goes to Arabia. Well, where is Arabia? There we go. Okay, so this has been kind of shrunk down a little bit. But, okay, so up here is Damascus, and you got all the way down here to Jerusalem. Now, it looks small, but it's actually way, way bigger. There's so many different cities and towns in between and all of that. But this is the, um, that's the Dead Sea, and that's the Sea of Galilee. And but instead of going straight to Jerusalem, like, if we just read Acts 9, verses 25 and 26, it says, oh, let out here through the wall, and then he arrives in Jerusalem. Very next verse, right? But like I said, there's more. No. He goes from Damascus to Arabia. And this is not Saudi Arabia like we know Saudi Arabia. This was a totally different group of people. Okay, so he's in Arabia now. And the people there are known as the, I'm going to mess this one up, Nabataeans. The Nabataeans, okay? So he's hanging out with the Nabataeans. They are all now low down. The Nabataeans are now all scattered all over the place nowadays in our modern time. They're in Syria, Jordan, and the Gap of Israel, the Sinai. They're all over the place now. But this takes us back. The Saul's conversion, okay? Saul started off in Jerusalem, and he's making his way all the way up to Damascus to take out Christians, meets Jesus on the way. And what is his motivation? What is Saul motivated by when he wants to take out the Christians? Okay, a little bit, yeah, that's definitely part of it. What else? Say that again. Okay, traditions of his fathers. Okay, we're getting warmer. I mean, they're both right answers. But what else? What's he driven by? No. Not yet. He wants to extinguish Christianity. Who's he trying to impress? Yes, but he's also trying to impress who else? Sanhedrin, who are people. He is driven by, he is motivated by the people. The, he wants the praise of man. He got, he's, if you, when we read this in Galatians, remember, he says, I was advancing in Judaism. He had many of my own age among my people. So extremely jealous for the traditions of my fathers. Was he really trying to do this for God? According to what Paul's saying here, it sounds like he was more concerned about pushing the traditions of his fathers than he was about building a relationship with God. And that was his motivation. He was motivated by the praise of man on his way up to Damascus. Of course, that all changes with his getting knocked down by Jesus, literally, and blinded for three days, can you, and, and then he has to be led to Damascus and spends time there and has Ananias pray over him, and then the scales come off his eyes and he sees the new vision. Now, what is it? Somebody said it earlier. He wants to please God. He wants to please God and not man. He doesn't care what man says anymore. That's why these guys don't want to kill him. I mean, they obviously want to kill him because he felt betrayed and he's not going to kill Christians anymore. But they, they also, he's like, I don't care who you are. I don't care if I offend you. I'm going to tell you, you've got to know about this Jesus. Let me tell you what Jesus did, because my ministry, I didn't get this from all my training. I didn't get this from a degree in, at Bible college. I didn't get this from a degree in, you know, the, I didn't major in the Sanhedrin. It does, none of that, all of that gets thrown out. And it comes.
comes right down to you. I want to serve God. And what is his mission? Preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. And his excitement is just uncanny. I mean, you can't stop it. You can't slow him down. Well, then, let's keep reading in Galatians here, verse 18. Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas. Who's Cephas? Peter. And remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only were hearing it said. And who used to persecute us, or he, he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith. He once tried to destroy it. And now, or and they glorified God because of it. His concern is about God being glorified. His concern is about sharing Jesus with the Gentiles. Okay? He spent between verse 25 and 24. Between 25 and 26, Saul, Saul spends three years between these two places. That's his boot camp. That's his training time. He's sharing the gospel with these people without the distraction of his grand reputation in this area here. Okay? This area here, man, he's known as like a terrorist against Christians. But over here, he's almost, not almost unknown. Almost. And they still know him, and they know of him, but they know him as the one who used to persecute Christians and is now preaching. And that's what's so exciting about Paul, Saul's conversion. He keeps coming back to it. Luke, the writer of Acts, is going to revisit Saul's conversion two more times in our study. This is what the church should be. It's, I love Saul's excitement about sharing. And, yeah, I tend to brag about kids because they're, they're my kids. And, and I do use them as examples. And Kaden blows me away sometimes. I know, I know. You don't have to tell me. I live with him every day. He is a spitfire. <laughs> he is. And I kind of love that about him. But it also drives me up the wall. Right? But he has got a good... Heart. I he's come up. I, I see him when he meets new people. I've caught him doing this. I've caught him in the act a couple times. Hey, you know Jesus. You don't know Jesus? Let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you what, what Jesus is all about. I'm sitting here for you. You're 70 years old. I never had that kind of confidence. And he wasn't like Bible bashing him and like, you're going to hell and you you know, I mean, he's like, man, there's this sincerity of, man, I, I know this Jesus, and well, this, is, this, is, this is what he's doing to my life. And it's like, it's just like this pure innocence, yet no fear of rejection. He doesn't really care. He's sharing Jesus with me. How often do we do that? How often do we do that? We get so caught up still, even as believers, sometimes in the place of God. Don't we? We're afraid of what people are going to think of us. They're going to think we're weird. But church, 
this should be our boot camp. Or this, if you don't like the boot camp idea, this should be our training day. Once a week, where we get prepped, and we get wrapped up to share Jesus with the rest of the world. When we go out there, we should be shooting out of there like a bullet ready to share the gospel. And if we're not, I've got more work to do because I'm obviously not doing something right. Right? But we're training. Today is training. And this place is where the real discipleship should begin. It goes beyond evangelism. Evangelism and inviting somebody in is step one. But discipling one another is the next step. How have you been discipled? How are you discipling somebody else? Have we taken that process? Are we going through that process? That's what we're doing with Olympians. It's challenging us to, have to, to put into practice our devotional life. And then out of that example, just like Jesus lived the example, out of that example, we are teaching, we're going to teach the kids to do the same thing. That's discipleship. Discipleship is something that we do together. This is where we really start to build relationships with one another. We challenge one another. We encourage one another. This week, as we go out those doors, ask yourself, who can you invite to church? Who can you invite to church? Who can you invite to know Jesus? They could be at church, but to have a relationship with Jesus. Who is God working on for you? How do you share the gospel? How do you share the gospel? Somebody brought these in to me today. This is one way that people have shared the gospel. My mother-in-law still leaves a track at every restaurant she goes to. Really good tip, too. But she leaves a, a gospel track at, at the table when she leaves. That's her way of sharing the gospel. Because eventually somebody's going to read these things. Right? And whoever it gets to is totally up to the Holy Spirit. That's one way. Another way is by meeting you. I met somebody this week. Turned out to be my neighbor. Down the road. Not a believer yet. Not ready to come to church yet. But another way of doing that is you build a relationship with Right? Then, the thir a third way is sometimes there's more urgency that you don't have time to sit and build a relationship and hope that maybe they're going to catch on to the Spirit. But there's moments where you're in that hospital and someone's dying and you need to know right now, do you know Jesus Christ? And if you don't, are you willing to accept Him into your life? Because I don't, because out of all sincerity, so bad to not suffer eternal hell. I want you to be with Jesus. I want to see you again on the other side. You know, I mean, you know there's a sincerity to that. There's a heart's desire for that. So as we go out this week, may we Get recharged. And hopefully today you've gotten recharged. And share the hope. Share the hope with somebody that you have right now. Because every one of you who have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior have the hope even after death. There's a whole world out there. Get recharged. Get fired up. Get excited. And go share this hope of Jesus Christ.
Lord God, we come before you. We thank you for your love. We thank you for Paul's story, for his example, for his life. Father, we pray that as we walk out these doors, that we will be fired up to want to share your hope with somebody or somebody. To invite someone to church, to invite someone to Bible study, to invite someone to know who you are. Give us that fire. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please stand and sing our last song with the worship team.